the art of social media and community building and engagement. And that's a lot of what I would call the art of it. And then there's just a ton of math. And so, you know, I have a lot of um, women, um, C, you know, CEOs, people thinking about starting companies come and chat with me. And, you know, I often, and I have to admit, I am very much a wonky math person, but I always will just start with some basic questions about math because if there's two sort of fundamental equations in e-commerce and if you can't make them work, it's just not gonna work out. Like, and, you know, and there's a, a user level equation and then there's a goods level equation and the user level equation is just, you're gonna take a certain amount of customer lifetime value. The customer is going to purchase a certain amount for certain profit dollars and that needs to be a significant multiple of what you pay to acquire that customer. So it's incredibly important to make sure the math supports you. And then the other really basic economic is how much you can make on a given transaction. So you have to really understand your product margin and then all the costs that will come after that around fulfillment and make sure still there's money to be had. And you know, so when I zoom up and look at this, you know, I think it is rare for one person to be great at both of those things because the math of knowing how to do quant marketing, analytics, conversion, operations, is often very different than the person who has the essence of the brand and the point of view and can pick the right products. And so the thing I would ask if you're gonna start an e-commerce company is figure out which one of those you are and then figure out the one you probably aren't and then you need to go find the person who matches who you aren't. And so one thing I did really early is I had a really strong thesis about the mom and what as a brand we wanted to stand for and what we stand for is sort of collective wisdom of mom, picking these best of products uh, that we then curate. And we, and we have a point of view on the kind of merchandise. It's eco, it's like wooden, um, more organic, more aspirational, but practical. But, I was, but the one thing I realized pretty early on is it wasn't, I wasn't gonna be the one picking it. So one of the early decisions I made was bring on a really great merchandiser. And, um, and that has been really helpful to me and it was a little bit like reflecting on my strengths. And then if you are the merchandiser uh, and you have the point of view, which is also awesome, dude, like go find someone who's really good at quant marketing and analytics and operations, because you're gonna need that too. <laughs> so. Cool, yeah, we have the totally same philosophy at Zappos as well. We're definitely more art than science. Um, so the next question's for Katrina. Um, we know starting any business is hard. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced either in the beginning or, of course, after you kind of got going a bit? Um, <laughs> there's definitely been a lot of challenge, a lot of and very diverse challenges, I think, throughout the life cycle of the company. It's funny because now I'm like thinking a lot about the math and the retail math side of the equation. Um, if I was going to if I was going to say one thing that I've learned, it is how important people are. Um, just period. Um, and I think, you know, when early in your business, um, like actually I think one of the investors told me this thing where it's like when your company is growing like this, like your people have to grow like that too or you have to keep on finding new people. So it's, you know, there's definitely an interesting dynamic as you're growing hand over fist of like the people, there are going to be some people who are right for you, who are right for you at like the early stages, beginning parts of the company that, you know, all of a sudden when you have the CEO of Walmart.com on your team no longer kind of <laughs> meet the same standards um, and aren't able to scale. But we also have seen tons of people within the company who were very junior before and have just scaled phenomenally and will continue to scale. Um, so I haven't quite figured out how to really find those people who can scale, but those people who can scale are unbelievably important to the business. Um, and then as you scale, just continuing to attract and find the right talent of like making a wish list of like, this is my dream team and keeping in touch with people, maybe getting them on as advisors um, and just really thinking big about how fantastic of a team you could have with you. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you can't, I can't style every fix. I can't um, pack every single shipment and, you know, you're going to have to have fi find people who can kind of do that part of the business with you and scale your vision or else it kind of doesn't quite work. Um, and on the same thing too, I think I've learned so much about this business and so much about retail. Um, and I think that people have this notion of e-commerce as being markedly different from retail and it's not. Like you're buying from similar vendors, you're buying at wholesale, you're selling it at retail. Like inventory is your worst nightmare. You have to manage your inventory because you will like sink or swim by your inventory. Like a lot of people I think think of e-commerce as being this totally different animal, but if you actually strip it down, it's very, very similar. Um, so I think I completely agree with kind of Mora's idea of just like Mariah's idea of um, 
of, um, of making sure that you understand the math part, but really even you know the marketing side is important, but the retail side of the math part too, of just like how fast is your inventory moving? What, what do you do when inventory is not moving? What are your investments in inventory gonna look like? Um, just because I think that side of the business, um, we learned very early some of the difficult things and now, like, now I know very well, but I wish I had known a little bit earlier. Cool. Well, we all know that marketing your brand online is a very expensive thing, um, and Google is actually quite expensive. So, Soraya, tell us a little bit about, like, do you spend a lot of money on marketing your brand, or do you, you know, depend on organic search to drive some of your sales? So Zadie.com, as I mentioned, is two months old, and to date we've spent maybe a handful of dollars on very small online tests, but we haven't spent a single cent on customer acquisition only because we use a lot of original content um, to help tell our story. So what does that mean? Well, in addition to being a brand born online, design focused, with an emphasis on marketing and quant, we also have a section on Zadie called features. And I suppose you could say this is part of our marketing spend, but we do commission articles from writers who have written for the New York Times, for the Atlantic, on stories that we think really complement the lifestyle brand that we're trying to uh, promote. And it's been hugely effective for us. I mean, one story that we posted on Zadie.com features has been circulated on social media over a thousand times. And that spend on Facebook would be quite substantial for a company of our size. Uh, what we're betting on is content as marketing. In addition, we built our own CMS. And for those of you who are less technical as I used to be, not so technical, CMS is a content management system. It's how we store all of our information, be it the inventory that we carry, but also the articles that we write. And on our CMS, we created our own um, entryway so that we could um, optimize our entire platform for search. That way we save a lot of money down the road in making sure that um, the search engines are picking up the words that we, that we publish on Zadie. Uh, we do be, believe very strongly in social media and we're proud to have close to 200,000 followers on social now in just about two months. Um, but a lot of that is because you know, people are ready for this, this movement and um, as Mariah said so aptly, it's, you know, it's really about having a point of view. Very impressive numbers there. Um, so Katrina, to go back to you a little bit on the inventory piece, I know we really had this challenge at Zappos as well. Um, do you run your own warehouse and do you inventory um, all your products in your warehouse or do you actually outsource it? Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a good question and this the um, wisdom that I'd heard about this early on was that companies often have it in-house in the beginning and then they outsource fulfillment and then they bring it back in-house. Um, in our case, currently we still own our own fulfillment. So we started, we actually had it in our warehouse where we like actually every Monday, for the first six months or so, every Monday, everybody at Stitch Fix was um, a warehouse worker. So we would all like show up in yoga pants and like all send fixes on Mondays. We only ship them once a week. Um, so the first warehouse that we had was in our office. Um, once, it was probably around the time actually that Mike Smith, my CEO, joined us, um, we moved the warehouse to actually to downtown San Francisco to 3rd and Folsom, this like beautiful wood old warehouse in downtown San Francisco, it was amazing. Um, unfortunately, we, had, we outgrew that, so now we're in South San Francisco. Um, but when you think about kind of the idea of 3PLing or outsourcing it, um, you know, one thing, I was really lucky to have Mike on my team. If I didn't have him, I don't know that we would have done that because it is a lot of time and effort, and it's actually a lot of people management. We have an amazing, amazing culture in our warehouse of people who love working there and love the brand, which Mariah has seen, actually. Um, and that is not easy to build. And so you really need somebody dedicated and focused on building that part of the business. Um, and so we still own it. It's also that our business is very complex. When we ship out five things, we're expecting people to send things back. So we actually have to optimize around return logistics. And that ends up being actually part of our secret sauce that makes um, our business pretty hard to repli replicate when people are very scared about kind of managing tons of returns. Um, and so it's definitely, it depends kind of business by business how complex your business is and how, um, how much the processes change and if you're paying somebody to build competency that you should just be building in-house and then also just if you have the time and bandwidth and um, kind of ability to focus on it and, and do it well. Um, but it's certainly, it's an open question and you know, we may not stick with our current strategy forever either. I think um, you know, it's one of those things that always evolves as your business evolves. Cool. So, um, Mariah, we know that customers are the most important part to 
all four of our businesses sitting here. So since you've kind of um, started to get to know your customers a little better, I know it is kind of hard to get your, to know your customers with an e-commerce site because you don't really get to meet them in person. But can you tell us a little bit about them or some things you've learned that have surprised you about your customers? Yeah, you know, so it's funny. My job before Citrus Lane is I had this really cool job at eBay where my market research budget was close to seven figures. Like, seriously, that's how much money I spent getting to know our eBay customers. I obviously were much, much cheaper at Citrus Lane. But, you know, what's funny is we found all these ways. Like, the world, it's a little bit um, like the talk this morning. The world has really changed. And so we actually, I feel like we are in a constant dialogue with our customers. And the thesis of when we started Citrus Lane was two basic theses. One, you know, a mom has this kid and the kid is constantly changing and you always have this need at each stage for advice and product suggestions. And two things have changed about the world. One is you don't live with your family anymore, so there's no sense of like the community of people around you give you help. And specialty retail is just dead. Like you're not gonna wander into a Babies or Us and ask for advice. And so we always started Citrus Lane with this idea that social was embedded and sort of threaded through it and that we would wa use the collective wisdom of moms. And you know, I would say that's actually been probably, the fact that that's worked so well is probably one of the most surprising things for me. So we have all these inputs to data. So we have this very active community and when the boxes go out, and so we'll send a monthly box and then you can also add stuff to the box. And when the boxes go out, we will get tens of thousands of pictures of the kids with the box, the kids playing with the box, and then we'll get all these comments of what people thought. And this is ongoing dialogue in our social media channels. Um, we also will send out a monthly survey. And you know, and I've spent a bunch of time doing market research over the years, and the survey responses are shocking. Like it's just bizarre, like you could get, like, I mean, because we're, we're pretty big now, like to get that, we're still getting like 40% response each month on the survey, where they go through and they tell us like product by product what they liked. And so, and then we, much like Zappa's, we believe in customer support as a relationship and brand building and learning channel. So we run our support in-house and we, you know, we have like people who like graduate from Wellesley running, you know, doing support. It's like people like really smart, thoughtful people and we get a ton of feedback through them. And, and we talk about it. We have a company lunch every Thursday and support stands up and talks about what they've learned from customers and social media stands up and talks about what they learned. And we look at it both qual and quant. Um, so we have a lot of feedback from our customers. So, I mean, so the one thing I would say is I would really invest in hearing your customer, both in quant ways, which are statistically good, and in qual ways where you really feel. And we do the thing that Zappos does where every employee has to do, well, I guess you guys do it in the training, we, every employee has to answer um, like 10 or 20 tickets a week. Uh, though engineering can, like, <laughs> engineering sometimes like does two tickets, fixes the underlying issue, and then we give them credit, and we're good with that. Um, so, and then let's see, so that's what we do, and I, I just spend time on that, because I think it's really worthwhile. And then we've learned fascinating stuff. Um, so I started this business um, really sure it was like a first time mom baby thing. Because I don't know how many of you guys have babies, but those babies, they're just spinning. They have needs, you know. There's like, I can't get to sleep. Like, the bottle interferes with breastfeeding. Like, what's tummy time? Like, why are they teething? It's just like, it's a nonstop. So I thought it was this first-time mom baby thing. Um, we're totally wrong, actually. I mean, there are a lot of first-time moms. There's just as many moms of kids with multiple. And we started at zero to 18 months. On the theory, it's like the little months. And we've expanded up to five uh, based on, actually, based on we were, had all these customers who were older in the system. And we just kept having to support them. And so it's funny, I actually don't know where the boundary is on the age where moms want sort of collective wisdom that's curated on advice and product. Um, and then the other thing that was really interesting to me is it's not, um, you know, I live in the Bay Area. I live in Palo Alto, which is, you know, not a normal place. I mean, I like it, but not normal. I grew up in Texas, very normal. And you know, a lot of brands get built and they're what I would call those blue state coastal brands. And, and, and that's not what we built. We, we, our density map looks like population. Mm -hmm. And so it's just interesting, you know, we're, Chicago's a huge city for us, Salt Lake City's a huge city for us, Dallas, super popular with military families abroad. And so there's just something really inspiring to realize like we've created a brand for every mom in America. Um, so lots of things I would never have guessed. Cool, and just to kind of wrap up a little bit, um, we're just gonna ask Soraya. So, 
you all really have relatively new business models that I'm sure in a few years are going to be um, the norm of e-commerce. 